there's not much to give you on my background other than I'm a member of the general public who's extremely concerned with the changes in the ocean marine life that I've seen in 47 years. And I've been trying to puzzle this out on my own for six years, uh, which has become an obsessive study. I don't know if anybody's seen. There's a few of you that I've had some email exchange with. Gary's for quite a few years, actually. <laughs> Uh, anyway, my, my conviction of the root of what's wrong is that um, systemic fertility has been subtly eroded by fishing. And I found that this is not, not accepted in the literature as a dynamic of what's, what's wrong or what's preventing the regrowth of the ground fish. Uh, for two reasons, it looks to me that there's two reasons why not. One is that the basic models don't allow for fishing to adversely affect the plankton growth. And the second reason it seems to be that there's a lot of confusing um, signals out there. Um, which, but mostly when I get feedback from fishery scientists who say fertility's fine, it's based on stable or rising chlorophyll or sort of relatively stable nitrate levels. And that seems to be enough to reassure them that that basic fertility is stable. Um, but I, I'm still convinced that the, the overall evidence supports more strongly the idea that it's been a long-term gradual decline in fertility and that somehow this has been connected to fishing. So how? Um, there's my website address if you haven't seen it. I've written a great agonizing length on this at uh, fisherprices.com. Right. Um, I don't need to give you a whole lot of probably background of why I, why I think fertility is declining. Um, these are a few things. The stump is starved, codfish on the East Coast and Shelf, 30 year declining return in the growth of the ground fish. I can't point here from that. Um, but more than that, there's more disturbing actually than those changes in the commercial fish is signs that you can see on the shoreline. Uh, long-term change. The, the shoreline that, that I've known since the early 60s, that I can remember since the early 60s, every form of marine life that I know has changed. Um, the seaweed, there's a lack of snails, there's a lack of barnacles, there's a big decline in mussels, clams, fish, all of it. See, it's, it's coming down. And then when you, if you suspect fertility and then you look at these specific changes in the seaweed, one change that has really remarkably changed in the last 30 years is in the, uh, the bleaching of the Irish moss. There's places where it, it was deep, deeply colored throughout the summers in the early 70s. I was a moss breaker at one time and then I went away and forgot about it. 30 years later I come back there in my kayak and it's stunted and it's bright yellow. And the physiology of seaweed supports that yes, this a, a lack of nitrogen would contribute to this change. Um, you can see it also, it, more subtle, but you can see it also in kelps, rockweeds, etc. But confusing the whole fertility question is a whole lot of green stuff. There's a big increase in um, ephemeral green algae, the, uh, the type I have here in the picture. It's all over my, my appearing to me, the shoreline with falling fertility has got this signal that's widely interpreted as rising fertility on it, which is more green stuff growing everywhere. So it, it's not that simple. Um, then in, in the literature, there's also been a frequent suggestion that actually primary production has recently increased in decades because the greenness has risen substantially. These are, you're familiar with these things, right? Yeah. Um, so this to me parallels the green stuff on the shoreline. It's ephemeral green algae, the phytoplankton basically. And um, I'm not all that reassured by it, but I'm really bothered to see the zooplankton indices all coming down when, when the basic model would have had them going up in response to rising phytoplankton. Um, now, there's been some publications recently although your author, the authors aren't here, that there's been a, a decoupling between your pelagic and benthic components, um, which I'm not convinced, but 
there seems to be a decoupling here at this level, which seems more serious to me, more worrisome and more convincing, that the, the strength of the link between phytoplankton growth and zooplankton growth doesn't, doesn't appear strong. Um, again, the shoreline, this is the last shoreline picture. Uh, the disappearing barnacles. I, I found this really startling. This is the, the shore at Peggy's Cove, the granite spur by the lighthouse. And the top picture is 1948, when Stevenson's documented intertidal life over fair amounts of the world. And they showed a barnacle belt, crusted above the rockweed belt, and described that as typical of our granite shoreline where there's wave action. And it was typical. This isn't the only slice of evidence that this is immensely declined on the shoreline. You can hardly find anywhere an actual encrusted barnacle belt above the rockweed. Hardly anywhere. I can, I've found a couple of locations with extreme wave action, uh, huge spray zones, and vertical rock. That's the only place I've seen what used to be the classic configuration of barnacle belt at top. Rock, weed, Irish moss. Anyway, um, so these two pictures, this is my photograph 53 years later after their painting. And there's other parts of the province where I found old records to compare with new. And this seems to be a general decline, which ties in with the notion that there's been a long term decline in plankton productivity. And I'm convinced that during the same 50 years, there's a major disappearance of the fish, that these had to be connected. That, and that fishing, that hauling out all the fish somehow eroded what was supporting the higher level barnacles. So I, I sat and thought about this for a very long time. And, and it, the only thing I came up with was that the fish eggs, maybe it was, maybe this was somehow the supportive link that was enriching the surface and supporting more barnacles was the fish eggs. And when you look at, this is from uh, some of the old paper, the, um, basically the, plant, the uh, bottom fish, reproductive cycle, mostly they're floating eggs. They come up, they show a strong rear coming up, they're coming down. It, there's, there's a net upward movement of organic matter involved in the spawning cycle of the bottom fish. And to me, this is a fertilizer lift. This is a fertilizer shift, as well as a reproductive effort. It, it uh, serves two purposes. And it's convenient that during the time when you know, the surface water tends to become nutrient depleted in the summer, but the sun is at its best. Um, so you know, there's, there's a, a deficit in potential photosynthesis. Maybe uh, only a little more fertilizer could come up. And the fish seem to do this. And the, the different species are staggered so that there's, you know, spawn all summer. And more so even than the fish is the, the bottom invertebrates do the same thing. So I thought maybe this was, this was the root. This is how, this was the link how the fish enriched the plankton and this was the root of how fishing eroded the fertility. Um, so then I thought, uh, how many other sea animals are doing the same thing, subtly lifting fertilizer during their life cycle, specifically nitrogen? Um, besides the eggs that float up passively, of course, there's lots of marine animals that actively swim up and down, um, fish, zooplankton, whales. And it seems to me that to the extent that any of those um, taps into any food resource at depth and releases the waste products at the surface, whether it's in the form of spawn or body waste among your feces, to whatever extent that, that animals transport this matter upward, they enhance the fertility of the system. So I call it biological forcing of new production. Um, and then I can't find this in the standard models. This is one 
just the basic physically forced production model from one of the DFO paper. And when you look, when you when you start from my starting point and you look for the um, the backward loops to support the plankton from all of the fish, it's not there. Fish, seals, seabirds. Um, it, as if their whole growth depends on movements of the physical environment, and it doesn't depend at all on themselves. And I, I think of this as a pyramid of parasites, that everything is basically parasitic on the plankton, which is independent of everything. And this is probably how we got to thinking that, well, we can be parasitic too, because we know we are parasitic on the marine web. So we could just step in for the, say, oh, other large predator, and everything else will hold its position. Um, another basic type of diagram showing the mineral cycling. Um, this does show the minerals looping back from the zooplankton and the carnivores. But what bothers me here is um, it's all passing through the decomposers. It shows the, this is too blurry, but the herbivores and the carnivores, so plankton and fish. The minerals cycle down through decomposers, which release nutrients, which presumably physical forcing brings back. Um, <coughs> however, I mean, this strikes me strange. Why isn't um, the ammonium, the tendency of marine animals to produce ammonium, that loop isn't included? Because that's, that's sh short circuit around the bacteria. So it's, it, bacteria is a bottleneck, which it really isn't if you have animals in it. Um, then there's a little more complicated, uh, like the Monterey Bay one, which actually does include ammonium in the center. It's a little bit schmoz. But nit nitrate is shown as acting as fertilizer and ammonium. And the ammonium is coming from micro zooplankton excretion. However, th this is, uh, you often see this, and this is regenerated nutrients. And it's not considered new. Um, and it looks as if for the bottom where we have loss and sinking, that the only way back up from sinking is when the physical model lifts it back up. So it strikes me that what's lost is the dynamic of moving animals and their ability to transport <coughs> new nitrogen in. Starting with the zooplankton, because it's nice to model them as regenerating <coughs> nitrogen in the surface water, but they don't stay there, you know, they, they go down and back up regularly. So if they're, if they're obtaining something at depth and raising it up, which they very well might be, because this really bothers me too, why they have bladders for their ammonium. Um, migrating copepods, for instance, uh, the ammonium has positive buoyancy, and these little animals have bladders, so it strikes me that they, it would be advantageous if they retain this while they come up, and if they ditch it when they fill their gut before they go down, so they pro they're possibly shuttling uh, nitrogen upward. Anyway, if I'm going to criticize your model and say that it's deficient, I'll have to build a new model, so I have a little exercise of how I would build you a new model um, running through how the ocean was built and how the cycling was affected. That's how I thought I would try to solve this. So, the early eons, at some point we got to having phytoplankton at the surface, sinking organic, bacterial decomposition, um, just following the nit nitrate, lifted up by physical forcing. So, the production rate more or less limited by gravity and the weather. The good fortunes of the weather bringing it back. Um, but this, this didn't settle into a balance. We didn't have a balanced ecosystem. I don't think we, ha we ever had one, or I don't think it wants to be balanced. I think it wants to keep going. So phytoplankton, of course, was stressed in, at some point by lack of surface nutrients. So nitrogen fixation was, was one solution. Then there was phytoplankton that did vertical migration by altering buoyancy. You familiar with these two? With the uh, rhizoselenia to change the buoyancy, that they, they would 
they would, the chemical composition of these diatoms is such that they sink down, they absorb nutrients at depth, then it changes, and they come back up to do photosynthesis. So this traveling down to get nutrients and back up seems to be started out with phytoplankton. Then it was the photosynthetic flagellates who did the same thing. Um, anyway, I don't know how many eons this went on for, but oxygen and dissolved organic material accumulated in the sea during this time. And possibly, uh, maybe it was a threshold of accumulated dissolved organics and oxygen, whatever allowed the beginning of the animals. So the first, the, so the zooplankton appear, and they're making use of the food and oxygen from the phytoplankton, and they introduce the, the ammonium loop, which accelerates the, the growth of the phytoplankton by about 50% in some, in some things. And this seems to be part of the nature of um, plants and animals in lots of, there's all kinds of models, which I'm sure you're aware of, where the rate of plant growth is accelerated by the existence of the grazers, from grasslands to limpets and algae to zooplankton and phytoplankton. And he said the zooplankton also did this vertical migration. And, and what I suspect, this, this is a hypothesis which I haven't found any background on because I, I haven't found that the, uh, this question hasn't been pursued. Is it that the deeper they go and the greater the hydrostatic pressure, does that affect the dissolved organic uptake dynamic of the zooplankton? And I cannot find where that has been pursued. And if so, if, if it's more efficient, the deeper they go, the higher the pressure. It's like the terrible 20 atmosphere gradient. Um, if, the, if the nutrient uptake dynamic is more efficient at high, under high pressure, this, this may explain the deep diving. I can't ask you questions now. Please ask me. Okay. Um, the, the next addition to the picture was bottom invertebrates. It was um, possibly, again, a, a, maybe there was a threshold of oxygen and dissolved organic material um, available in shallow bottom. And we had the appearance of multi, multiple types of invertebrates. And the pattern of lifting nitrogen up is, is easily seen in the invertebrates, too, because they use the floating eggs. Fairly sedentary adults release many millions of eggs that float to the surface, eggs that can absorb dissolved organic material on the way up, so they reach the surface with a bigger payload than they started out with. Some of these invertebrates use ammonium for buoyancy as well, which makes me, which, which also helps me to, to suspect the migrating crustaceans might use ammonium for buoyancy on the way up too. It might be part of how this nitrogen lifting goes on. So the dotted line is floating eggs, which have, are dual purpose reproduction and surface fertilization. And I suppose I should say the purpose. You can't say that the eggs are released for the purpose of fertilizing the surface because nothing does anything other than for a selfish purpose, right? Um, but if, enri if enriching the whole system is a very good, ultimately selfish purpose, if, if the food supply is increased, then it is, re it is reinforcing, self-reinforcing. Okay. After a couple hundred million years of, of this setup, fish appeared. They also, well, I, I have the green arrow shows what they're eating. But of course, they are also eating bottom invertebrates. Um, and fish are excreting ammonium from the gills. And to whatever extent that they are either swimming in the surface and excreting it, then they're regenerating nitrogen. To whatever extent they are obtaining nutrients at depth and then excreting any of that surface, they're raising it. So fish are also tied into the same things.
Small fish. Then there was big fish. Um, it seemed as if the whole animal web was, you know, colonizing the midwater as well as the top and bottom. And big fish also seem to follow the same pattern. This would be codfish and whatnot, with with many floating eggs coming up. To some extent, they also migrate vertically. There may be some ammonium lift as well, but the eggs may be the main thing with the big fish. Okay. They are very big fish. Um, now, big sharks. I have the eggs coming up from the sharks too, but these aren't shark eggs. These are the uh, invertebrate parasites that would colonize sharks. Apparently it's very common that there's a lot in the guts and all over them. So, uh, this is how we had the shark looping at the same thing. But there's something really different with, it seems as if once we hit the really big fish, uh, something is different because they're no longer doing the the multi hundreds of thousands of millions of eggs strategy. So maybe maybe this is uh, as far as fish could go. That it, you know the sea was getting full of fish and that they were they were reaching a limit. And it seems to me that since since each of these reinforces the primary production, uh, that it's a su this expanding thing until some, something limits further expansion. So I'm thinking we get this fish, is, the sea is getting full and full of fish. Well, what limited the expansion of fish? What stopped more fish from getting in the picture? And I'm just guessing, I'm thinking that um, maybe it got oxygen limited. Um, if you get too many fish in in a certain man water, have oxygen stress. So, so maybe they got, maybe it got that crowded. I mean, the, the stories of, of how thick the fish were are pretty, pretty fantastic from five hundred plus years ago. So, if it was oxygen, then integrating um, air-breathing predators would be a way to further accelerate primary production. So I put warm blood air, air breathers, but the first ones, of course, were cold blooded. Um, and they've kind of given way to the warm blooded ones now. So that's your seabirds and your whales and your seals, which mainly feed off small fish. Not really big fish or very big fish. And the eggs coming from the air breathers are, are also uh, parasite eggs. And the fact that they're warm blood probably makes them really good incubators. So, like for instance, the worms that live in the seal stomachs, um, I don't know, I got the seal guy here, but just just looking at what I've read on that, it looks like possibly, uh, you know, a gray seal could excrete five million invertebrate eggs a day in the surface water with a species. Um, plus there's, there's urea. Anyway. So, I'm going to look at the whole thing. I see the, the entire animal web, which is where I use my red ready, as, as all working in, together in a way that boosts primary production. And it's the extent to which they intercept productivity and cycle nutrients back to the, to the phytoplankton without going through bacterial dump decomposition is the extent to which they add to productivity the climate forcing would produce. It's faster um, and it has the advantage of being able to store materials and uh, release them strategically like in the summer. Also, horizontal transport can be, can be looked for, you can see that too. Um, now, I just want to look at the oxygen implications of it, and this might be confusing with my O2 plus and minus, but what I mean is oxygen demand, and just the sort of a, a gradient as it developed from bacterial decomposition, which is high oxygen demand, so that's why I've got oxygen demand plus plus down in the corner, 
all of the fish and invertebrates um, have some oxygen demand, but it's still one, one class. But the air breathers have a negative oxygen demand because they don't take any oxygen from the water column, but they facilitate oxygen generation in the water to the extent that they stimulate photosynthesis. So the entire animal web sort of conspires to oxygenate the system. Okay. Now we've changed it. This is what we this is what we have now. Um, virtually no big fish. And I'll say declining small fish. Some some sources have said there's an increase in small fish, but that's not that I'm not convinced. Declining zooplankton. The increase in phytoplankton is uh, sporadic. The increase peak in the spring boom, but a actually global decrease has been reported. And apparent increase in warm blooded air breeders. I have a question mark up there because really I think they're the, the power of this is decreased as well, but we hear so much about the exploding seal herd. Um, in different parts of the world, they're getting aggravated by how many whales are around. They want to kill off the whales to, to revive fish. Uh, bottom invertebrates, I have a question mark by the decrease, but I don't think it's much of a question really. Um, on the Scotian shelf, we have uh, extremely poor growth of the fish that depend on the bottom invertebrates, plus we now have all kinds of signs of failure in inverted fisheries. Um, so it's probably pretty safe to say that that's, that's decreased as well. So the, the whole strength of the diversion away from this bacterial cycle, the whole, the whole animal web together is, is much impaired now. And along with all the troubles with fisheries, we now have dead zones. The United Nations Environmental Program um, reported this year that dead zones is a mounting serious threat to fisheries. Um, if I toggle back and forth between this one and this one, um, see the, the funnels of where the, 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 sinking, the sinking material, is, I don't know what the, what the, the, the proportion seems like there's greater proportion now going to the bacteria than the invertebrates, or than the animal wrap, I call it. So is that, is that a significant part of what's happened? So the, the dead zone, this is a well-known cycle that is positive feedback, tends to snowball and accelerate. Um, Things start to rot, drains the oxygen, more things die, and it spirals. Um, now, when I look at the whole thing, this is what I end up seeing, is two <coughs> competing uh, forces, both tending to positively reinforce themselves. There's, there's the hypoxic cycle, and then I just put see this plankton and small fish, but that, that represents the entire animal, animal web and its useful integration of the plankton. And it also has a tendency to speed up. And it seems to me that to the extent to which one of these gains, the other one will lose. And I'm not, I'm never, not sure exactly what to call these two cycles. Uh, you could call them anabolic and catabolic um, cycles in the ocean as a whole, with the, the blue one being anabolic, tending to build organic material, and the red one tending to break down. But it's even a sort of competing forces. And is this part of how the animal web took over the original dead zone of the ocean like this? And, and is it losing ground now? And is that part of why we're seeing an increase in the dead zones? Because they're not just the polluted estuaries. Um, there's been a, 
I was told it was a, a 70 year declining trend in the oxygen saturation of the uh, Gulf St. Lawrence. And now you see places where there's upwelling on the western coast of Africa, on the west coast of North America. The last last few years there's been this dead zone event on the Oregon coast where there's upwelling. And they're saying oxygen poor Arctic water is upwelling. Anyway, there, this was not observed before, but this seems to be a mounting thing. Places where these things happened occasionally, where upwelling would sort of overwhelm, if the animal web isn't very strong, you can certainly see how upwelling could sort of overwhelm it and the, the dead thing could kick in. Um, it seems to be mounting in those places as well. Dead zones triggered sort of naturally, as well as dead zones triggered by farm runoff and sewage. So I, uh, these two uh, competing cycles, I think of them as another kind of oxygen tension. And the animal one, the little cow wheels can reach up into the air and take some oxygen from there. I have no idea how we can time. Okay, um, so if this is how it works, the model that I drew, out, and, and the, the force of the biological control on the plankton declines, what will we see besides uh, increasing dead zones? Um, this is the 20-year uh, trend in global phytoplankton chlorophyll from the satellites. Do, have you familiar with this? Oh, yes. You are? Okay. Well, they saw declining chlorophyll associated with rising temperatures and increased stratification, which, which they see, the, the, main, the big decline is at the pole with the blue. The blue is a big drop. The yellowy is more or less stable, and when you get into the reds, that's actually increasing chlorophyll. Now, what I, what I see is what I would predict, which is if, if the animal component lost its strength to moderate the phytoplankton, because it, it's great, it grazes it intently when it, when it peaks, and it tends to boost it up with post ammonium when it's low. So if this whole force weakens, you're going to have your highs to get higher and your lows to get lower to the extent that they're physically forced. So f where there's like positive physical forcing, we'll see higher spikes. And where there's negative physical forcing, downwelling, we'll see lower. So what I see there is, is on the continental shelves where you have your, your seasonal mixing, which is physical forcing, the spring blooms are higher and it's gone red. Um, there's also physical forcing at the equator, and there's a red streak right across the equator. But the blue, that's where we have downwelling. So that's like negative, negative physical forcing, um, where, the, where, the, where the water movement pull, accentuates pulling stuff down. Don't that, I mean that clear or not, but you can tell me shortly. So on, the, on this spatial thing, this seems to agree with me. I think, yeah, I think you find what you look for. Like, and as far as the, the temperature shift, well, maybe it's enough to account for it, maybe it's not. I know that where, they, where, the, where the spike went up to the equator, and there's another one down in the southern ocean where there's also upwelling, they detected a temperature drop in the very center of that that was like a tenth of a degree 20 years. Now, is that enough to account for the increase by the plankton by the forcing? I don't know. Um, they also, out of that, pulled up for the North Atlantic, the seasonal shift. The dotted line is the early, this is 1978-86, the early pattern of chlorophyll. And the later pattern shows a higher peak and the deeper valleys, which I'd say is exactly what would be predicted if the net animal control of it all was slacked off. In the summertime lows, now we're seeing some really 
weird and wonderful plankton blooms like the coccolithic form here of Newfoundland. The, the coastal zone scanner apparently didn't see these, but now in the high latitudes of the Pacific as well, this turquoise, this is, I don't, you know all about this. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a type of plankton that normally grows in very low nutrient conditions. So I, I, I see this report, but I don't see any speculation as to why in the literature, as to why it's why we have this tropical looking aquamarine bloom off Newfoundland and in the Bering Sea. It's, it hasn't warmed up that much. Um, oh, I was going to say something else too. Besides the cockle of the forest, there's a whole array of harmful algae blooms that's also increasing. They also are typically the class of organisms that thrive when nutrient conditions are very low. Um, this is just out of uh, Dan Polly's book when he uh, knew the land Labrador shop in the North Sea ecosystems and he's got the trophic levels as the slices of the pyramid and the volume represents um, tonnage per square kilometer per year. Anyway, it's about a century. It's just the massive drop in the fish production, which uh, I expect that somewhere in there is a reflection of a loss of power of the biological forces. And fish, um, I'm just going to say that everything, as far as I can see, all of the troubling trends in the fish stocks are consistent with a, de a decline, a systemic decline in fertility. Um, from the stunted growth, uh, the poor condition, the maturing at small sizes seems to be part of a homeostatic mechanism to stabilize zooplankton, perhaps, since that's what these eggs are feeding into. Um, and, and really remarkable on a species by species basis is the range contraction, because you can see how species all maximize the range in a richer sea and it all contracted as it became poor. And each one seems to do that. Another, another comment about a lot of this fishery literature that I've read, um, I get frustrated by the lack of information and the illusion of stability in things that have an underlying instability or they're, or they're compensating we don't know. And, and one is the small pelagic fish. They're supposed to be doing quite well. The herring and the mackerel and the capelin, well, they're supposed to be flying high on the East Coast shelf. But they're not a, a big focus of, of worry that, that anything negative is impacting them. But when you look at, um, at the next three slides are from the Gulf St. Lawrence. And this is a diet of capelin from the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s. And the biggest piece of the pie is the small zooplankton with the filter fleet feeding food of capelin. And that has declined, um, interestingly. So mackerel show the same thing. The biggest slice of the pie, small zooplankton, and, and then it's it's a remarkably smaller slice, from 70% to 48% a decade later. And the Southern Gulf as well. Anyway, that, that's the kind of data I'd like to see in all the fish, but I really can rarely find it. And mackerel, you look, you look at the fisheries, the landings, the tonnages, the estimated biomass, but there's something going on behind the scenes with the mackerel because there's a diet shift. And is this a warning sign of something losing its leeway. It seems to me that there's just about nothing that's actually stable. And when you see predictions or forecasts based on the biomass of herring, the number of seals, and as if they can be expected to produce and withstand pressure the way they did in the past, maybe when the biomass number was the same, but so many other parameters are not the same. And here's another 
the decline in bottom water nitrate formation, um, which was noticed rather abruptly in 2001, and it, it stuttered along at a lower level since. This is, um, that's a Scotian shelf, but the Newfoundland looks the same. And I'm not seeing any good explanation for that. But it certainly does seem consistent with the general fall in organic productivity overall. Now, confusing the picture is, I'm not going to say very much, but um, there's so much, there seems to be a, an understanding that all the coastal zone is affected by eutrophication. And if you see change, that's it. It's either eutrophication or it's global warming. And the, the change in the seaweed is remarkable. This, this growth of fine green fluff, brown fluff, slime on everything. Um, and everybody's first impulse, including, it seems to me, many of the seaweed scientists. I mean, there's whole books written on the increase in the growth of the green tides and how it's all eutrophication. However, th this, this here, if you look, this is the same area, just a slightly different angle. And you can see that besides all this massive fluff, the base is Irish moss, which is yellow. And if you know this area like I do, you know hey, that color looks like that it was actually deep purple Irish moss 34 years ago at this location. And this whole change doesn't reflect an increase in fertility when you have a perennial seaweed giving a clear signal of decline in fertility. So it's like mixed messages from the seaweeds. The perennials look like they're losing fertilization. The annuals, at first glance, look like they must be more fertilization. There's another um, kelp, very pale. Um, kelp that lacks nitrogen will turn white like that. And that, that's, a, that's at my home as well, where this kelp was a dark brown in the past. Same kelp. Um, last comment on the pseudo-eutrophication, which is what I call the, there's, there's so many symptoms that actually are the same, it seems to me, if you have real eutrophication, increased nutrient loading to the point of sickening your system, or if you have oligotrophication, what are you going to call the reverse, and, and a decline in the animal component, even to the point of what this is, is um, an Irish moss belt, which is plastered with small blue mussels. And I've seen a little bit of this in recent years, and this summer it was just a fantastic increase. Did anybody else notice this? Uh, massive settlement of the little blue mussels all over, nicely established, that have been there as long as I ever knew, moss belt. And the area covered by blue mussel is one of the indicators of eutrophication. It's one of the indicators they're using in the bay funding monitoring that they're doing over on the New Brunswick side. They're looking at how much green seaweed, area covered by blue mussels. And they see an increase in that. And I did write to this, this scientist doing this, and I said, are those mature blue, mus blue mussels or are those small blue mussels? And he said, well, we can assume that small blue mussels will grow to be big blue mussels. But no, you can't, because these won't grow to be big. Because I, I've, I've seen this in a few spots. And I go back and check the same spot. They don't live. They don't make it through the winter. Starfish eat them, or they just go away. And mature blue mussels, are actually greatly declined. But if you're just going to say the area covered by blue mussels, you might see an increase when, in fact, you don't have you don't have eutrophication at all. The, the reason for the increase, I'm not sure what it is. It could relate to uh, a la lack of grazers eating them and greater survival. So from the lack of oxygen, increased ephemeral greens, even increased blue mussels, that can all occur in both instances, real eutrophication and pseudo. So, so what I would recommend for monitoring ocean fertility or maybe ocean health, um, I underlined the things that should be the least ambiguous. Um, I think the oxygen saturation 
it's got to be a, a, a really good indicator. And I find it very worrisome to see it declining. And dissolved organic matter is also necessary for the, what did I call it? My anabolic cycle, the, the whole animal web. Part of the foundation of that is, is a reserve of dissolved organic matter, which is a dynamic reserve. And I wish we had monitored that, because it would be nice to know if there's been any change in, in that, because that's, that's got to be a crucial health indicator, as is oxygen. Nitrate and chlorophyll and direct carbon fixation, there are certainly all worth looking at, but I think there's a lot of interpretive troubles. Same with um, plankton. Bacteria counts. Uh, a rise in bacteria counts, seems to me, is, is, is likely an ominous signal as well that the, um, the larger animal force as a whole is, is declining and more than bacteria. Um, and the rate of nitrogen fixation, and this seems to be increasing. There, there's, all these, there's all these reports in recent years that we've discovered these tiny new nitrogen fixtures, fixing organisms are more common than we thought. It's, it's a more significant source of nitrogen than we thought. But they're not saying, it's actually increased. It's just like we know more how to look for it. But I suspect it has actually increased. Um, now, this, the size and condition of perennials and the range of organisms, I mean perennial animals and plants both, I think these are probably the best indicators um, of ocean fertility. When you have codfish that can grow to six feet long, you probably have a very healthy fertile system when you have codfish that's pooping out at 20 inches, then that, that's, that's an indicator. And the, ra the range of organisms, especially when you can see, their, you can see the, per the periphery of their range changing, that's like with the barnacles is an excellent one, but you can also see it in the seaweeds. I also wonder if the net standing stock of everything wouldn't be a good indicator, but I don't know how you get the numbers. And of course, there's atmospheric variables. If you're talking about primary production, then it's linked into the whole global carbon cycle. And if ocean fertility was falling, we'd see a gradual accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. So, viewing it the way I see it all, I have to tell you, for a precautionary ecosystem approach, I don't think we should pull any more threads out of the web. I think it's seriously weakened. It's just barely holding it together right now with the players that are left. It's losing ground. It's, it's not maintaining zooplankton stability. It's not maintaining oxygenation like it did. I'm extremely worried about it. So, um, you have to extend the moratorium to everything. So, uh, what next? Ecosystem-based fishery management. I'd, I'd like to see you get to the point where um, just, the decision on the gray seal cull would be that no, we can't do it because we have no big fish, no large predators besides them left. We have negative zooplankton. We have falling oxygen. That's why we can't have seal cull. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Better turn it off, Ron.